Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, about me, I'm a, as, you, as a, I was just uh, as I already introduced, a lead developer. I live in Spain. I've come over here from Spain to give this talk today. Um, so thank you for attending. I know there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on around here. So thanks for taking the time to join me today. Um, I work for Pixel, but I've been working on a project for B Sky B in the UK. Um, it's been ongoing for, for, for nine months to almost a year now, in fact. And we've been completely restructuring and re-architecting and re-implementing how we deliver video content to mobile devices in the UK. So we've had the opportunity to completely re-architect the solution. And the framework that we went with was CXF. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is really about uh, how we modeled our data, and then how we then implemented um, some HATIOS principles, how we tested it, how we leveraged various annotations, and then some final reflections on the CXF community as well. So a lot of different things. Hopefully, there's something for everybody. So the, the domain. Uh, space is the SkyGo catalog that we'll be working with. The examples will be all about videos and movies and ser series and that sort of thing. Um, one of the biggest problems we had was the, the various different client types that had to integrate with our service. Um, varying different requirements, different usage models, patterns, etc. And we really had to come up with an API that accommodated a, a really wide variety of, of requirements from our clients. And we support PlayStation, Xbox, um, Android, iOS, PC, various different uh, web frameworks are integrating with this API to get content information about what's available on SkyGo. Um, we did it using a, a, a principle which I'm, I'm sh who's heard of Hatios? Hypermedia is the engine of application state. Who was, who was here for, for um, Les Hazelwood's? Storm path yeah. talk, OK. Yeah, <laughs> so you learnt about it there? Yeah. OK. Um, there's going to be a bit of an overlap with, with some of the things that he discussed. Uh, I've got some different perspectives on certain things, so uh, you, you can make your own mind up on which you prefer. Um, and we, ha we had a scheme for linking resources together. I'll talk about that in, in detail. Um, so. Yeah, CXF and Spring. So REST design is difficult. I'm reiterating what Les said uh, yesterday. It's really, really, really tough um, because there's no specification. You really have to think about the clients. You have to have a lot of domain knowledge. Um, and whenever you make a decision about your API, you're making a trade-off normally. And there's a, th there is a real tension between architectural purity, you know, the, the Roy Fielding REST way, and what's convenient, what's easy, what's practical. Um, we, we got a long way with the architectural cleanliness. I'm quite happy with what we produced. Um, but yeah, we did make compromises in certain places as well. And that's just part of the design process. Um, so th th the first thing that we did was to look at the, the business domain what the domain was we were trying to model through our API, and distill some entities, some resources that are part of the system, and really separate them out, consider, consider what they are and what the attributes of those, those entities are, and um, figure out what information is available on that entity, on that resource. Um, one of the heuristics, the design heuristics that we, we used is any one of these attributes should only be found on one resource. If you can find a piece of information on two resources, then there's a problem there. You've got duplicate information. You're not modeling your business, business domain, your entities correctly. So really try and distill down where the information belongs, what is the home, have a place for everything and everything in its place. Um, and the next thing we did was work out how these various things are related. Um, and, and that's just drawing a content graph 
an object graph. So in this, in this case, we have a video. That's normally the centerpiece of, a, of, a, of the catalog. What channel is it available? Is it part of a series? Is there a physical file that the, the client needs to acquire? If, th if there is, which CDN location do we need to get that from? Your domain will be different if you're, if you're doing some REST modeling. Your domain will be different. That you, you, you really have to uh, model this first and really consider where the information is going to live. The next thing we did was to define links on the resources. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our schema for, for links. It's different from the one that Les presented. And I'll, I'll, explain, I'll explain why. So we, we had a separate links object as part of our resources. So Les in the previous talk said, have, have an attribute, let's say the broadcast channel, and then have that uh, be, uh, contain the links to, to the broadcast channel. We went for a different model. Um, we put all the link objects in a separate links um, attribute or field of the resource that separates out the link resources from the resources that are, <coughs> sorry, from the attributes that are part of the resource. And that meant that when a client was traversing our object graph, they didn't need to ever be aware of the domain model, the attributes, or anything. They could just get a resource, find the links, get a resource, find the links. They never, need to be, ne never needed to understand the, the, the structure of, of the entities at any point. Uh, the other important thing about this as well is sometimes an entity can lose a relationship. And say, for example, a video has a series. Um, if, if a video no longer needed a series relationship, then it's a breaking API change to remove that attribute from a resource. We, didn't want to ha we wanted to create the most stable API possible. And having a link section with an array of objects means that we can remove associations without having to uh, do what would be considered a breaking API change and remove the links. So th there already exists um, an RFC for web linking. So it puts, it puts the, the links in the header. This didn't work for us because, as you'll see, we wanted to be able to expand related resources. And expansion is the topic that Les spoke about uh, yesterday. And we used extensively in our API. And it worked really, really well. So that's really the first subject that I'm going to cover. Um, so yeah, we didn't want links as part of, a part of, the, uh, part of the, the entity. And by having a separate link section internally, we can model the, the, a resource quite easily with an interface. The interface has a, a, a collection of links available on it. We also had the concept of a, a self-link. Um, one of the principles of um, hypermedia as the engine of application state is that every single transition of our clients should be followed by following a link in the resource. So even a refresh, even the client hitting the refresh button, um, they should be able to follow a link. And what that means is that the, the entity's identity, um, i.e. the URL to get back to itself, is contained in the resource itself. Um, so that has advantages as well. And it has even more advantages when we come to expansion because the self-link contains the link back to its expanded state. So. I'll talk about that in a second. So what we end up with is a, an object graph. And each of the objects should be um, referred to via a URL. And that URL is its identity in the system. So what it means is, by following links, the client can start a, a resource, and it can discover content around it. And uh, discovery is a really important concept because it decouples the client from the URL structure. Um, a, a, a client can start at an entry point and they can navigate the way and find the information they need just by following links. And that really decouples the client from the structure of the data. 
we can make changes to how things are related without having to create breaking changes in our client. What we found, though, is clients wanted to get information um, about multiple resources in one go. It makes a lot of sense. The client um, might want the video on the file. They don't have to make two HTTP requests in order to get information that's associated with an entity. So although we've got a good, clean model on the server side, we've got um, a really well-distilled set of resources that we're exposing through a RESTful API, we, we need to accommodate the client. So we use this concept of expansion. So the client's requested a video, but they're saying, I, I want the representation to include the file and the CDN location if the attribute x equals y. So they can select related resources um, around the resource that they've requested because it's convenient, because they don't want to have, have to make multiple requests. So that gives us the best of both worlds. It allows us to model our data in a sensible way with uh, information only discoverable on resources, um, but then give the client the ability to get more information if they need it without having to make multiple requests. So let's say, for example, uh, the client requests a video they want to get information about the channel that's available on. Maybe they want the image. They want to display the image to the, uh, to the client. Then they request the video. But they also say, well, I want you to expand the broadcast channel. And they're able to then get the, the fields off of the link object itself. So the way the client knows that a, a link has been expanded is if it has a link section embedded within it. So we have this kind of recursive pattern. And you'll notice if I go back, what we're saying here is expand the file, but then expand its links. So you can have recursive amounts of expansion. Expand this node, expand its related associated content, and expand its associated content, and so on. Really, really useful for us. Because as, as I said before, sometimes the clients wanted the whole site navigation structure in one go whereas other clients wanted to navigate it through multiple requests. So we, ha we had to support these different requirements. Expansion was the key uh, to allow us to do that. So what we essentially came up with was an expansion mini language, uh, a, a little language that allowed clients to um, select links, expand them, select related links, and and basically completely customize the, the representation that they wanted. So it's like a RESTful query kind of language, really. So we exported, um, ex sorry, supported expansion, nested expansion. So expand that resource and then expand its links. Um, or expansion, so expand, um, expand, say, the series and the, um, the broadcast channel, for example. Certain links had um, attributes. This was, a, this was another important part of the link schema, is that certain links had other information about, apart from just how they were related. So we, we had to support more metadata about links and, and, a, and a separate attributes object um, was added to, to our link objects. We could have tagged the uh, additional metadata onto the end of the rel. But that's slightly more difficult for our clients to parse. They said, well, just give us another object. So we listened to them, and we gave them a, a separate object that they could index to find out more information about the links. So this form of expansion here is useful, for example, when a client wants to get um, an A to Z of content. They want to expand the, 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 the all content with, say, uh, starting with the letter A. They could say, expand all the children, but only if the only if its uh, index character is A. That was how we solved that problem. Another um, technique we used was what we call field inclusion. So they could say expand this relationship, this attribute, this link type, sorry, but only show me field A or field B. So this allowed the client to reduce the, the, the 
the amount of data that they were getting and it allowed us on the server side to put in a few performance improvements because we didn't have to retrieve a lot of data. If they just wanted the image of the broadcast channel, we didn't have to work out and, and get from the database a huge amount more, more information. And uh, all of these different types of link selection uh, were, were interoperable. So you could use uh, nested expansion with field inclusion um, to any level or depth. Um, we related links um, in two parts. So our rels were, were separated by a slash. The, the first part says, what is the nature of the relationship? And the second part is, what is the resource type that I will get when I follow that link? So we're telling the client what structure they're going to receive when they follow a link, and that's really important. So obviously, the client now is in a position where they can expand the whole content tree. So they could essentially uh, request the full site. So what we had to do is implement some restrictions on that. You can only select a certain amount of data. So in our, in our case, we were able to um, say, because we, we actually controlled the clients, um, give, us, give us the list of expansions you want. Sorry. Uh, we, we, didn't, we don't support that at the moment, no. No, uh, there has been talk of paging responses. Um, but no, we don't, we don't actually support that as it stands. But theoretically, the linking structure could support paging quite easily. So the implementation was tricky because potentially the client can request um, any kind of relationship it liked. So we extended the link, ob our link object, which contained the relationship, the href, and a, a title, and the attributes. Um, and key to making this work was the concept of a supplier. Who, who's heard of the supplier interface? Anybody heard of the supplier interface? Um, comes in Guava, um, is available in Java 8. It's the simplest interface you can find, just has one method, get. Takes no parameters, returns a generic type T. So what we said is when you're building a link within the system, you have to uh, supply the means to get that item if the client requests it. So every single time a link was built, we had to give a supplier for it if the client requested its expansion. Um, so, so our framework would then say, right, you've, the, the service method has returned a resource. It's got a set of links. The client's given this um, expansion syntax. Okay, that link needs to be expanded. It would then get the, re the supplier for that, that linked resource and pull it out. It would then set it back on the link. And we use this annotation here, JSON unwrapped, which uh, instructs the Jackson uh, JSON serializer to basically pull out all of the contents of the resource and um, include it in the link object itself. So that allows this, this uh, what you're seeing here. Basically, um, otherwise, the, uh, the, the resource, the link would have had a, a resource field and then the resource within it. So that, that was a far nicer way of doing things. Just unwrap the, the linked resource and put it directly in the link. So in order to build links, you need to know a bit of information about the URL to actually um, get that resource. So when you're using JaxRS, you provide a, a service method and annotate it with that path. Um, you're able to get the metadata about that, that particular method um, using the resource info um, interface in JaxRS2. You can do it in JaxRS1. Uh, it's a little bit trickier. You need to deal with a little bit more with the internals of, uh, of CXF uh, exchanges and things, but JaxRS2. Sorry if I'm covering a bit of your <laughs> topic. Um, so we, we had a nice API for building links from here. We could then introspect the service API, find which returned a video, which is this method here, 
We know what the URL is from the app path annotation. It takes a parameter. We can supply that. Um, we can add attributes to the link. We need to give it a supplier. Um, and that worked really well for us. We, we were really easily, uh, it was really easy to um, build links within the system once we had this framework in place. And uh, CXF provides all the means to do that. So a few ex um, observations about expansion. It's becoming increasingly popular. It's been spoken about at conferences. As I already mentioned, Les Hazelwood earlier in the week um, has spoken about it. Netflix have used it. Um, documented it in, in books, you can read about it. It really worked well for us. It allowed us to maintain a restful, clean hypermedia API, yet allow the clients to get what they wanted out of it as well. So it really bridged two competing um, concerns. A bit of an open question. Uh, I know there's a few CXF guys here. What extent could a, could a could a framework or a specification support this kind of pattern if it's becoming more, uh, more, more well used and more popular? There's nothing out there at the moment. We had to basically re-implement it from scratch. Um, we also, I also mentioned the field inclusion capability. The way that we implemented that was to wrap the resource in a proxy. So when, when we first discussed this as a, as a feature, I thought we were going to have to maybe scan through some JSON or do some clever object traversal to set values to null if they weren't in the field list. But one of my um, colleagues came up with a, a really elegant solution, which was when the resource is returned from um, the, re the, the JAXA RS service method, we wrap it in a proxy and we, we give that proxy the field, the inclusion list. And when the serialization framework tries to serialize, serialize the attributes and it calls, say, um, it calls a getter, if that getter is in the field inclusion list, it delegates to the resource, otherwise it returns null. And that, was, that, that worked, I think he implemented it in a day or two days and tested it and it just worked fantastically well. And it worked equally well with XML or JSON. So a really nice uh, approach, approach there. So, any questions about that so far? I'm going to move on to how we did some integration testing, a nice little trick that we used throughout our project to do integration testing. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, I, yeah, like I said, I thought we were going to have to... Um, hook into Jackson, uh, Jackson or I wasn't sure how we were going to do it. So when he came up with that, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, really good. So yep. seen a lot of Jaxar two stuff, but what's specific to CXF? Um, nothing that I've, nothing so far, no, 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 no. Um, but integration testing, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to more CXF. So we wanted a framework that would um, allow us to do integration testing quickly, cover a, a large set of, of the, the, the players in, in the system. Um, and we wanted the testing to be at a level that would allow the test to migrate if they needed to migrate um, to, 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 say, different transports. We wanted to stay within the JAX-RS spec. Um, so we didn't want to do any testing that involved containers, and we didn't want to have to mess too much with uh, communicating with our database or data repository. So what we came up with was, a, was an integration test um, structure that covered everything beneath the sort of container. So that includes CXF, spring configuration, any providers and intercepts that we registered, our REST interfaces, our, domain, our actual application logic, but then ended it at the repository layer. Um, and this worked really well. We, ha we have dedicated test teams that um, test against deployed applications, can set up databases and so on, but that's it's too, it's too much for, for the level of integration testing that we wanted. 
So CXF includes a, a, a transport abstraction. Um, so behind the, the JAXA specifications uh, and the interfaces that it provides, CXF allows you to um, in, uh, leverage different transports. Th this is the, um, the actual means of transporting the messages. In production, we use the HTTP transport because we use HTTP. But because we were programming to the JAXRS interfaces, we could actually configure CXF to use a local transport for integration testing. This proved immensely useful to us. Um, it took a little bit of configuration to get it right and to get it to work, but not too much. And our tests ran very, very, very quickly. Obviously, you've got to start up the Spring application context and all the configuration that's associated with that. But once that's all done, the tests absolutely fly in milliseconds. Um, and we, you, know, you can test the entire application very, very quickly. And any development changes very, very quickly without having to deploy to a container. Um, so yeah, the local transport. Messages don't leave the JVM. Very, very quick. You have to use a, you have to use a local URL scheme that, that allows um, the CXF server to recognize that we're going to use the local transport. Um, and this is how you configure it in, in Spring. It took a little bit of uh, upfront architecture uh, and organization of our application context in Spring to leverage this. We had to separate our repository implementations because we don't want them to fire up. We don't want them to connect to any data repositories. So we put them in a different application context. And we parameterized our application context that contains the JAXRS framework and its components and the, the business logic. Because we, we needed to tell JAXRS to use the HTTP transports in production. However, for testing, we needed to use the local transports. So we had to externalize a little bit of configuration. Um, so in Spring, you can use a property placeholder um, in these attributes here, address and transport, the two key ones that control the transport. And then in the web XML, you can pass in the CXF servlet, you can pass in parameters into that application context that are resolvable by Spring. Um, so Spring will resolve these properties against the parameters that you passed in the web XML. So the web XML becomes like the caller. It's passing parameters into the application context. Really, really useful. For testing, you can inject properties and property sources into the application context. Um, so we would say, fire up the app context, put these properties in there, and then they would be resolved to the local transport instead. So what we ended up with was, was kind of this arrangement. The container registered services filtered up, um, not, not, not included, and the repository implementations were, were not included either. So we had to mock them somehow. I'll, I'll come on to how we did that. One disadvantage of this approach um, is that any um, container registered services obviously are not covered by the integration testing. So you have to think about that. So we, we couldn't, for example, test um, our page caching um, because that was implemented in EH cache and it's registered as a, as a filter. Um, I've seen that there's a uh, container abstraction in JAXRS2. Maybe, maybe there's some, some work that we can do to, to improve that state of affairs in JAXRS2. I don't know. So, stubbing the persistence layer, um, our repository implementations was, was easy enough. Um, I'm going to show you a quick demo uh, around that. If I can work out how to. Missing a, 
the side of my screen. But I think we can see enough. So this is a Jack's RS server. Uh, definition in Spring, you can see I've got the property placeholders there. And we've got one service, which is a really simple echo service. It takes, um, it takes the, um, the message passed in the URL, echoes it back in the response. Uh, just looks like that. Yeah, maybe I can reduce the size a bit. No. Yeah. Oh, that's a bit better, isn't it? Um, so in our test, I'm using Spring's um, annotation-driven application configuration, and I'm importing the CXF server XML definition, which contains all the beans for the service. Um, the echo service refers to this bean here, but it depends on a timestamp. So this is going to just add a timestamp to the response. So it's a dependency that I don't want to test in this case. What the Spring um, configuration, annotation configuration allows us to do is to add beans and, and control the application context in code within the test. So this is the test case. You can see it's going to do some testing down here. But we don't have this timestamp repository implementation available. So we want to provide a, an implementation of that for testing. We want to mock it, basically. So we can use the, who's familiar with Spring's annotation driven? No one familiar with it? OK. It's, it's, it's really useful. It allows you to basically generate beans um, in code rather than in XML. So here we've defined a bean within the application context, um, and it's just stub to return a timestamp. And that means that our test down here that asserts um, that the, me the res respons response message would contain a timestamp will pass. Um, what this doesn't give us is the ability to control. So in a normal integration test, we want to simulate different responses from the repository to see how the application deals with those. Uh, we might want to throw exceptions, we might want to return nulls, we might want to return different values. So it's much better to return a mock. And we can actually return an easy mock of that interface. Um. What Spring allows you to do within your test is auto wire in beans. So we can then auto wire and get access to that, mock, to that mocked interface. And then we can control it, control the mock. Even though it's a, sp it's a Spring bean dependency, we can now have it available in the test, set it up, um, and make customizations set expectations and have it do what we want with, for our specific test case. So we can do um, get the timestamp. And for this particular test case, we're going to return So what we have is the full application um, with the, the, the spring production configuration bootstrapped in the test. 
but we're able to set up expectations for the mocked out layer, which is Sorry, the resolution's got a bit wrong here. Sorry? Yeah, it's okay there. Uh, slide down a little bit. There we go. So this was really useful. We, we, we use this now in, in all our different projects. We use Spring a lot. Um, so we, we, we use this in, in, in some other projects within the Sky. It's great to have end-to-end -end integration testing, including the Spring configuration, including all of the JAXRS contain, um, registered providers and interceptors, et cetera, but then just control and stub out a thin layer at the bottom. It gives us a, a lot of confidence about how the application is going to perform in production, but with immediate feedback very quickly over the local transports. Um, yeah, it solved a lot of problems for us. Any questions on that? So we used annotations extensively in other areas of the system. Um, this is an example of a JAXRS um, interface. We came up with a, a, a neat way of mapping um, exceptions to error codes. Um, normally, in the past, we've, we've used, say, Spring to register different error mappings in a separate file, or we've had um, exception mappings done with a big switch statement, or various different approaches. Um, this allows us to declaratively apply error code mapping to the service method itself. Um, so you can just look at the, the service de declaration and you can very easily see that if a user not found exception is raised, it's caught, the status is a 404 and there's a message in there as well. It's really, it, it really simplified how we, we wrote and managed error mapping in the system. Um, we also have a, a mechanism to actually, off the exception, uh, resolve values and have them included in the uh, message as well. So you get a bit of customization there as well. Um, we did realize, however, that um, these annotations were starting to grow. So you'd have one service method and it might contain 20 error codes for various different types of error scenarios. So what we did is we introduced a stereotype like meta annotations. So this is an annotation on the, the, uh, that hosts other annotations. So we could replace a lot of error code mapping for common error code mapping co uh, sets. So user management, if it's dealing with a user, then it, you might get these sorts of user not found exceptions. So we could put those on an intermediate what we call a meta annotation, and you could just apply that to the, to, the, um, to the service method directly. Again, a really useful way for us to compose and create APIs for various different things, including er so error, error code mapping was just one instance where we used this technique. Uh, the other instance was security. We implemented our own sort of custom HMAC uh, implementation. Um, we applied this using um, an annotation onto the service method. Um, so if, 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 we, if we wanted to add security to an endpoint, we just add an annotation in the framework, picks that up, um, and an interceptor uh, uses CXF 
to find the, the target resource method and uh, applies the security off the annotation. So we could, uh, in this case, determine which headers and whether or not the body was going to be rolled into the HMAC signature. Um, we found that annotations work really well in test configuration, um, particularly good for defining test setup. I really like using annotations to configure Spring. I think it works in a lot of scenarios. Not every scenario, a lot of people would disagree with me, particularly um, uh, where I work. They say that the XML is more explicit. But I, I like uh, co the configuration style for configuring Spring. It just, it's just more natural to me. Uh, I, I find it easier to navigate code more than XML. I find it easier to read and understand code more than XML. I very much prefer it. So I've been working with Sergey to discuss how we can use annotations to actually configure um, CXF. So CXF uses this, this namespace in Spring uh, for, for, for using Spring to configure CXF. Um, the, the, the annotation equivalent uses, uses code. It's code-centric equivalent to producing um, beans within Spring. So hopefully we'll get somewhere with that. We'll see. <laughs> um, so that brings me on to my, my final point. For those who are evaluating different um, competing REST impl um, CXF implementations, uh, I've found that over the five years that I've been using CXF, um, the, the community element of CXF is really, really, really strong. And I would encourage anyone that uses CXF to get on the IRC channel because they're really sort of knowledgeable and, and the amount of, of help that I've had um, from, from the likes of uh, Dan Culp, who was given the presentation earlier, Sergey, um, has, been, has been huge. I can remember um, about five years ago, I was working uh, on a SOAP service, and I found what I thought was a, a bug uh, with its error handling. I went onto the, 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 the channel and discussed it, and it was a guy called Dan Culp who was um, responding to these questions, telling me to register interceptors that would do various bits of longing. Um, and I later realized that he was the project lead of CXF and you know really knew what he was talking about. So that's where CXF stands out for me um, above all the different implementations, that, that level of, of res uh, responsiveness and, and helpfulness. And uh, I, I wouldn't be here giving this presentation today if it wasn't for the encouragement of Sergey, who said, why don't you come and give us a give us a talk about what you've been doing. So, <laughs> yeah, so. Honestly, yeah, um, I, 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 I've over the, over the years had a huge amount of, of help from just on the channel. So yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I've never, w never been in, uh, worked with a framework that's had such a responsive CXF, um, IRC channel as CXF. And it really makes a huge difference. Uh, I've been in situations where we've, we've been you know, under the gun for releases and had help you know, immediately, and it's really been hugely beneficial to us. So I'll be, I'll be buying some pints <laughs> tonight, yeah. <laughs> You gonna be around tonight? Yeah. <laughs> now you know you're gonna get free beer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't know how we're doing for time. Okay. Pretty much out of time. Uh, yeah. I work for Pixel. They've sponsored me to come over here, so thank you to them. Uh, we do internet streaming um, technologies. Uh, I wouldn't be here. Uh, giving this if they hadn't sponsored me from doing it. So massive, massive thank you to them. Any questions? Hi, yes. Yes. 
So, yeah, we use enunciate. You heard of enunciate? Heard of enunciate? It introspects uh, JAX-RS annotations, produces documentation. We extended enunciate to cover the error codes. So not only was our error code mapping done in code, but the documentation was driven from that as well. So we absolutely knew that the documentation was aligned with our error code mapping. So we extended enunciate to, su to support that. It really works really well. Uh, enunciate's really good. You can, you, know, you can skin your documentation. It, it understands all the relationships, and you can just navigate it um, as if it's like a site. So uh, really useful. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. So we were lucky enough to have a guy um, who'd worked on the project for a long time, really understood the domain model. Um, he was instrumental in helping us to understand all the different um, resources in the system. So that really helped us. And then we also spoke extensively with the different client development teams and said, upfront, this is what we think it's gonna, going to look like. Will this give you the information that you need? They, they had some concerns. They, they wanted to do, say, breadcrumbs, so they come in in a node. They wanted to know the parent node, so we support parent expansion to get back to the site root. Um, so they, they had some concerns about that. We said, well, this, this is the uh, expansion or represent parameter that you will pass in the query. It will give you all of the parent. You just follow the parent links. Um, so an extensive consultation, really, with, um, process with our client teams. Um, it was, was key, key to, to, to the success of the API. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, see you around.